Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Hope that you're having a, a good week so far, and I hope that you're ready to study the Gospel of John. Here in a few moments, we'll be picking up with John chapter 4, there in verse number 25. But before we do that, let's bring everyone into the study this morning. Gentlemen, it looks like you all survived the eclipse. No eye damage, no weird sunburns, nothing like that. And we're all still here. Yeah, I was going to say, the Lord didn't return, you know, so. I saw an eclipse back in 1980, and, you know, you've seen one, and you've seen them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you haven't seen one, you haven't seen them all. I've heard people say that about conversations with Bob. If you had one, you had them all. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. We we didn't see much here. I mean, because where we're at, we didn't get close to the totality of it. But um, we were outside working in the garden when it got kind of a little bit darker. And it was kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, it didn't let's get see. Inside my apartment. It didn't... <laughs> we, we actually witnessed something more spectacular. Oh, really? Me and Mickey. Okay. Yeah, a, a a second Bass Pro Shop in Southern oh, California. Yeah. Oh, that's what we were doing while, while the eclipse was. Yeah, that was pretty. And neat. you did, you didn't need special glasses, did you? No, we didn't need special glasses for that. So. <laughs> All right, let's see. We have several who have joined us so far and who have chimed in. We have uh, Chris Kramer, and David Clark, Jerry Wilcox, Javon, Jesse from India, actually and James Dodson, and there may be others. So we'd like to invite you to chime in. So if you have joined us on our Facebook page and you're watching the live stream there, where there's a comment area, just say, hi, my name is Bob from Minnesota or wherever you're at. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any thoughts or comments about what we are studying today, feel free to use that area to drop them in to, to let us know what you have to think. If you are on our YouTube channel, then just use the chat area there. And again, let us know who you are and what you have to think as we go through the course of this study. Now, if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like to send to us, you can also do that via email. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. You'll see that on the screen there, or you can target an email directly to Brian if you want to. Send it to brian at truthfactor.com bob at truthfactor.com, et cetera. And um, we'll get back to you from that direction also. So Mickey, let's go ahead. And this is Mickey Galloway. Where are you um, currently at, Mickey? I can't remember. We live in Colorado, near Colorado Springs, a little town called Peyton. Uh, oh, okay. Moved there to be nearer to our daughter. Uh, had some health issues a while back, and she thinks we need to be closer. You look well, like you're in Bellflower. That looks like. Yeah, Bellflower. We're in Bellflower now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mickey, Mickey actually was preaching in Lancaster, California for about a little over 30 years. And, and he just recently, uh, quote unquote, retired, if you can call that for a preacher. You know, I mean, he's doing meeting work and he's doing some other things, but but he's holding a meeting for us this week, doing a very good job, as is always the case. And and so it's certainly good to have him with us. I, I also wanted to real quickly mention uh, you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned a uh, uh, Dodson on here. Uh, uh, Richards is a other name, and he actually is on a on a program just prior to this. Uh, Berean Spirits come. It comes on one hour before Truth Factor on, and of course we left that and came to this yeah or, or as it finished and actually my son joshua is a part of that one so if someone wanted to watch the brian or join the brian spirit study uh viewing it where where would they go to for that tom uh, uh it, it's uh let's see youtube it's on youtube and on facebook and i know they also they also have a uh um oh website the recording uh, oh. uh, they, yeah they make they make it available so, I mean, but Berean Spirits, just go to Berean Spirits on YouTube. Richard, you may throw that into the comments somewhere here. Sure. Uh, you, can, mm -hmm. you can tell them what they need, and, and it'll it'll be in the comments. So. And, Bob, remind everyone about ARE's broadcasts. ARE is uh, Tuesday and Wednesday at noon, Facebook and YouTube. Okay. 
Look up Answering Religious Errors on YouTube and Facebook to find the pages. Yeah, uh, error is singular. Error is plural. Singular? Singular, yeah. Singular, okay. 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 Religious error. It's all just one error, one big error. I mean, it's... <laughs> not arrow, but error. Yeah. Error, yeah. Yeah. Everything right. but is error. Everything but what, Ta uh, but, uh, Paul? Truth. Everything but truth is error. error. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see. We're going to pick up with John chapter 4. We had left off last week. We studied down to about verse 24 there. So we're going to pick up with verse 25. We're just going to, I'm going to read 25 and 26. We're going to take a minute. I want to take a brief detour um, into why the Samaritan woman would have believed in or expected the return of the Messiah. Won't be a big discussion, but just a couple of things we'll think of, talk about there with that. And then we will continue with verse number 27. So let me go ahead and bring it up here real quick on the screen for everybody. And here we have it, verse 25 and 26. Jesus talking with the woman at the well, kind of jumping into the context here. He had just told her that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, as we saw last week, he had already revealed that he knew stuff about her, talking about her, the, the marital situation, the fact that she really, the husband who she's currently married to was not really her husband. And so he had already impressed her with this knowledge there and his statement about who uh, God seeks to worship him. But um, Brian, let me start with you. Does it seem like it's out of the blue from our perspective? That she would say, I know that the Messiah is coming. And, and John clarifies, I guess, who is called Christ or the anointed. You know, it's very, in, it's very interesting how she kind of uh, approaches this because, you know, she perceives he's a prophet. And then Jesus starts talking about this big change in worship that's coming um, and, you know, how God's going to be worshipped. So it's interesting she goes from the step of you're a prophet to you're, you know, you're actually the prophet, the big, uh, the big prophet. Um, we'll pause for a second and, and add something. I think we mentioned it last time, too. Um, our understanding about the Samaritans is that they are people that follow a portions of the Law of Moses. They do not follow the prophets, though. They only follow the Law of Moses, which is the first five books. Now, now I have to be careful. I, I've gotten in trouble for saying that before because I, that's kind of there are nuances to what that might mean. But generally speaking today there are still samaritans and they only follow the first five books so so she wouldn't have a lot of the messianic prophecies that we're familiar with uh psalm 22 isaiah 53 um all the the minor prophets zachariah that that mention the messiah and tell us the things like where he's going to be born where he's going to come from what he's going to do she only has one particular prophecy and that's that prophecy that we find in deuteronomy chapter 18 about the one that's going to be like moses so when she says you're a prophet, not impossible. She could mean that you're the capital P prophet that we mentioned in chapter one, um, and that uh, that she could be connecting, making the steps to connect that, because the coming prophet, and this is an important idea about what Moses prophesied, the coming prophet that was going to be like him wasn't going to be like other prophets. He would have things to say like Moses did. He would speak, uh, you know, Moses is the mediator of a covenant. Well, the coming prophet then is going to be the mediator of a covenant. And one of the important ideas is, like when Jesus gives us the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, everybody says, wow, here's somebody who spoke with authority. That's different um, than, than other prophets speaking. Other prophets are speaking about the things that have been taught by Moses. They're, they're in other words, they're kind of subsets of Moses. But the capital P prophet speaks something new. That's why the gospel is something new. That's why the Sermon on the Mount is something new. That's why when Jesus has things to say, and we sometimes point to this in areas like, you know, Jesus is teaching on the church or Jesus is teaching on marriage and divorce. These aren't things that Moses said. These are the things that, that are new, the new covenant, so to speak. So it's important for us to see that's her frame of reference when she perceives he's talking about a change of worship. That's the capital P prophet. That's the great prophet that's coming 
that's going to be similar to Moses in that he's a mediator of a covenant. Um, the book of Hebrews really delves into that too. So, Well, let's take a brief moment, uh, Brian, and let's look at um, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 19. And then we've got other comments we'll, we'll bring in after that. But you want to read that for us? Yeah, but I wasn't there, and I'm going there right now. You Deuteronomy, it. wonderful thing. 15 through 19. Deuteronomy 19, chapter 18, 15 through 19, New King James. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak all to them all that I command him. Do one more. Verse 19. Oh, uh, 19. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require of him. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> let's uh, have this discussion on this. Bob, I think you had your hand up just a moment ago. Yes. Uh, well, I do think that she recognizes that uh, uh, Jesus is a prophet. Uh, and I do think that Moses had a specific prophet in mind, even though he uses the indefinite uh, article, or he does not use the definite article. She does not use the definite article, a prophet. I think she's being general. But then she says, when the Messiah comes, and that's what's unusual, because the first time the word Messiah is used in the uh, Old Testament is in Daniel chapter uh, 9, verse 25. It's used again in verse 20, uh, 26. And then we don't see it again until John chapter uh, 1 and verse 41. So even though they may not have accepted anything other than the five books of the Bible, they did seem to understand that there would be a particular prophet who would be anointed and who would be a fulfillment of, uh, of the, the prophet that, uh, uh, that Moses, uh, predicted. And so, uh, to my mind, she's got two things in, in her mind. She first recognizes Jesus is a prophet or he would not know these things about me. But then she seems to think there, there's a, somebody else coming, and he's the Messiah. So I don't think she thinks at this point that Jesus is the Messiah, but she yeah. does seem to expect uh, the Messiah to come. Yeah. Well, you think about it. If uh, Brian and I were talking about this earlier, the the Assyrian captivity took place seven 720, 712, somewhere in there, a, uh, BC. Um, they, you think about from that point forward, you've got 700 years. And then, and you think back to when the Southern nation came back from Babylonian captivity and resettled in the land there. They may have had some measure of influence, even in the teaching upon the people in Samaria, maybe not directly related, but there could have been some, some um, influence there possibly. Um, but, but I, and I think you're right. What you're saying there, Bob, is that she perceived Jesus was a prophet, but it's Jesus who's going to make the connection here in just a second. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. And he, and, and she's probably saying that because of what verse 24 said, we'll bring that up here for just a moment. Verse 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Truth. He says the time is coming when this will take place. So she makes connection between that statement and the coming of the Messiah. And then Jesus says, I am he. But her phrase there, what I thought was interesting, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Any thoughts about that? He's going Just to answer all questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And That's you know, John, good. interestingly, interestingly, he just had told us all things to her. Yep. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, literally, that, that's yeah. that's what gets her attention. I mean, he told her everything about her life that only a prophet would know. That's and true. so Jesus is able to say, not only am I a prophet, I am 
the prophet. That's right. Yeah. Well, and I think that tell us all things is again a reference to the expectation Moses was setting that he was going to he was going to be the totality of the revelation. You know, Moses kind of sets it. He's going to be like me and and uh, you know, no other prophet shows up and says, "Hey guys, I've got a law from God." You know, here it is. You know, the rest of them are just saying, "Hey guys, let's go back to the law of Moses." Hey. Right. But this next prophet is going to tell you something different, and I think that's a little bit again what you might be saying. He's going to tell yeah. us all things. He's going to he's going to make the law, and and maybe that's particularly useful for a Samaritan who's you know who's kind of stuck in this limbo of you know we're we're supposed to believe certain things about who we are and they're not true. Jesus Jesus just said they're not true. In fact, but um, how are we going to you know act? And this new prophet's coming. Um, and it must have been really exciting that this new prophet says, well, I have a message for you. You know, this is something for you, too. And it must have really been exciting. Yeah. You know, you know, yeah. And, and if I can really clear, clarify, you know, obviously the point I was making is is that's the application of the text is that he's going to he's going to bring in a new law. He's going to be a lawgiver like Moses was. But I just find it interesting that he had just told her all things concerning her life. You know, you've got the. You got the minor illustration. If Jesus can tell me all things about my life, yeah. then it's possible for him to be the Messiah that we're looking for. And he is going to tell us all things. And he will start by teaching. You know, uh, I mean, he goes into the he goes into the village as we will read here, and eventually they're convinced to follow him, not because of what she said, but because of what he said. Yeah. You know, I see a connection also and in Deuteronomy 29, 29, I, I think I used to use Deuteronomy 29, 29 in a way that was, I really didn't think now is foreign to the context. Uh, the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed, they belong to us, uh, that we may keep the, keep the will of God. I, I don't have the quote here, but that's essentially what it says. I don't think the secret things are talking about things like God's favorite color, uh, but the things that God ultimately will reveal, but will re re uh, keep to himself until the time of the revelation. And, and Messiah would be the one, the prophet of Moses, Messiah would be the one to reveal all things that had been kept secret. And that's what, that's what uh, Paul says in, in first Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter two and, uh, and Ephesians chapter three. And, and how many times does he say that in the new Testament? Uh, there is the mystery, but that mystery has now been revealed. And, and so, this is what she and other Samaritans, I would assume, just as the Jews themselves were looking for, the Messiah who would reveal all things. She may think that Jesus might be the Messiah, but she certainly recognizes that he is a prophet. And then when he, when she brings up the Messiah, he says, I am he. So now, now she has a, a clearer idea of it. And of course, he goes into great detail uh, later when she brings her, her friends and neighbors. Okay. Yeah. Um, quick question. Since you just spoke, Bob, uh, we had a comment in the chat room. Let me just bring it up here real quick because it does kind of, I'll let you kind of answer this because you, you, you just touched on it. Uh, Jimmy says, could the secret things be the things that we as Christians see as gray area things? I, yeah, I, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that there. If if it's a gray area thing, why would God keep that to Himself? I I don't see any gray areas yeah. where God is concerned. Everything's black and white with God. Yeah, and yeah. He wants us to understand that. It kind of like Paul. Paul talks about that with the eating of meats. There are certain things that were specifically wrong stated by God. Right. All right. And then there are things specifically commanded by the Lord that we've got to do. For instance, they were not, they were only supposed to worship the Lord, their God. They could eat meats offered to idols. What they couldn't do is eat meats offered to idols in the temple of the idol, you know, and partake in that. 
And so if it's an area that's not been taught, in other words, God's not forbid it, he's not commanded it, it appears he leaves it up to us to make the proper decisions. You know, and so gray areas oftentimes are things that we disagree upon. You know, where maybe my conscience says it's wrong, but your conscience doesn't. And it's based on my understanding of a verse versus your understanding of a verse. Um, the clarity's already been put there by the Lord. It's, it's up to us and our understanding. Yeah, but, but even still in Romans 14, Paul says uh, these are areas where God is not concerned. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it's right. Not, it's not that it's a gray area. Yeah, it's I that think, he's uh, concerned about it. And, and he leaves it up to us to decide on certain matters. Yeah, good point. If I understood what oh. Bob was saying, that there are certainly some questions you can ask that are not revealed in scripture. I mean, that's just, that's just a fact uh, that uh, not anything we need to know, but there are sometimes questions people can ask us and, and we just, the Bible does not expound upon that. And it's yeah. my understanding that Bob does not think that Deuteronomy 29, 29 is talking about those things. Uh, the things that you could possibly ask that scripture does not reveal. Uh, you probably have encountered some of those questions in, in personal Bible studies and say, well, you know, and they'll come up with something really off the wall. Am I, am I correct? I used to use as an example of this when I thought that. Uh, what were the many other words with which Peter spoke to encourage the Pentecostians? Oh, I'd really like to know. I mean, that was the first invitation, basically. Uh, well, if it, if it was necessary, God would have revealed them to us. And I believe they are necessary, and I believe he has revealed them to us in other places. But that is one part of the jigsaw puzzle that God decided to put elsewhere. And Since so, we're all, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. no, I, I wrapped it up. Since we're on this thread of secret things, let's bring in Chris Kramer's uh, comment real quick. He said, Paul said that the gospel was once a mystery in Ephesians 3. The secret thing could be a reference to that. Although I do believe there are things that we are not privy to. You know. and, I, and, and I think that's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, God held, held things back from, a, from the yeah. Jews. During but keep that it age, but yeah. he now revealed those things through Jesus, and and I think that would be a good connection because um, to Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine, yeah. to you know the mystery of the salvation of the Gentiles fulfilled, revealed by the apostles. Yeah. Are right, any other thoughts on that? I've I've got two. Let's see if I can remember them real quick. Hopefully they they are still relevant. One might not be. So I, I got started thinking about, um, oh, yeah, two things. You know, you think about Jesus' words to the apostles in John chapters 14 through 16. When he talks about he would send the Holy Spirit who will teach you all things and bring into your remembrance all things whatsoever I've commanded. That's a little bit like, a little bit, what they were expecting in Deuteronomy 15 or Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19 that one would come who would teach them the law. Jesus saying the Holy Spirit is coming who would bring them to the remembrance, all things, whatever he had taught. The other thing is, you know, Brian, I think you mentioned this point or the point you mentioned kind of brought this to mind. We kind of maybe do the same thing as this lady did when he says that, you know, maybe she's looking for the Messiah, that he'll finally, he'll finally settle the debate between the Samaritans and the Jews. He'll finally be able to, to, to tell us who's right in this. Well, we kind of do that sometimes too. I had a teacher back in college and, and Paul, you would remember him is Brent. He said, I can't wait to get to heaven. I've got a whole bunch of questions for Peter and, and Noah and all that, you know, and um, we kind of look forward to that moment. But then I kind of wondered, will it matter? <laughs> will all those questions matter at that point. But anyway, a little bit of connection there with, with, with what you she mean, said. Like what, 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 was, what size planks did Noah used in putting the ark together? Uh, yeah. What was did he have to pitch yeah. that he pitch. used? <laughs> and and wh whose room was next to whom? Yeah. When we yeah. went out, when we saw the ark encounter, they, there was something I'd never considered. They actually had rooms for what you would think, you know, rooms for for each of Noah's sons and daughters. I never thought about that. They probably all had their own individual family rooms 
in the ark. I've just always pictured them all hanging out in one location. But <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Not important anymore. Then the last thing, real quick here, and then we'll get on to the next section there. As it's already been said, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. That's a direct statement, declaration on his part that he is the one that she was talking about. All right, let me see. We've got a couple comments. Let me catch up real quick here. Uh, let's go ahead and bring them in before we get to this next section here real fast. So Chris goes ahead and he says, Paul said there were things that he could not reveal that perhaps he saw not first to know in this life. Good point. Um, let's see the next one. Okay, that's not, sorry, Eileen, I just shared your problems to the world there, or to all 20, 20 viewers. Um, <laughs> okay, hope your battery gets recharged there. And um, say that again, Bob, Chris is right. Yeah, he wants to hear that again. And then James says, well, the Samaritans accepted the teachings of John the Baptist. Could she have heard of the Messiah through him? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, very interesting question to quote Brian. Don't don't forget to share Tom's question. Um, where's your question, yeah, Tom? He's he's talking about in our oh in, in our, our private chat. chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The most important point. question uh, that we'll he, have to ask. He probably didn't. Oh, when we that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I mean, did, did Adam have a belly button? That's the question. No, but if he probably God had a punch out for future one. designs. If God wanted him to have one, he had one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So. Let's talk about something we can know for certain now. What happens okay. next? <laughs> and what I mean by next is so so here we have we're about to start in verse twenty seven. The one the G, Jesus just said to this woman, um, I am he. I who speak to you am he. And at this point, the disciples come along and they kind of interrupt the conversation a little bit. So let's start there and let's read beginning in verse number 27. Uh, Mr. Tom or Mickey, if you'd like to, to read for us, start there in verse 27 and let's read down through verse. Um, it's going to be a hard, a, 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 not a great point, but let's stop at verse number 33. For just a moment. Okay, and, yeah, and I'll have Mickey read. And incidentally, John, mm -hmm. uh, Mickey uses the 1901 American Standard. Really? Can you get that up, or you want to? Can you get that up, or you want to just leave it here? I, I can't. I'll wow. need to blow the. I'll need to blow the dust off of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what, let's see. What do we say? Twenty-seven through thirty-three. 33. Okay. 33. Yeah. All right. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Mickey. All righty. And upon this came his disciples, and they marveled that he was speaking with a woman. Yet no man said, what, speak, or what seekest thou, or why speakest thou with her? So the woman left her water pot and went away into the city and came to the people. Come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Can this be the Christ? They went out uh, of the city and were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples prayed him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not. And the disciples therefore said one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? All righty. Thank you, sir. So when we come back there to verse number 27, um, what... Uh, what was it about the scene there, Mickey, that surprised his apostles? That Jesus was speaking to this woman. Do you think it was because she was a Samaritan or just the simple fact that she was he was talking to a woman? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a reasonable answer. <laughs> yeah, actually, he used one more word than I used. All right. <laughs> I just said yes. <laughs> yeah. Any thoughts on that? Or? Well, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. during that course era of time, they were not considered much above a slave. And, uh, that Jesus was speaking to a woman was one thing, but to speak to the Samaritans, as despised as they were, that was 
kind of the icing on the cake. Well, and she was she she was surprised earlier that Jesus was talking to her. Yeah. Sorry, Bob. Go ahead. I was going to say that since they're in Samaria, it would probably not need to be specified. Uh, there's not likely oh, to be a yeah. Jewish woman at this well in Samaria. And so, yeah, if if if, if it had been in a situation where uh, it could have been a Jewish woman, they might have specified Samaritan. But that's not what intrigued them. They're in Samaria, and he's speaking to one of the women. And that's that's to me is what blew their mind, uh, kind of. Yep, yep, I agree with that. Yeah. And my Bible is in parenthesis, but back up in verse nine, it says, "For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans," mm. and so uh, the, I think. Uh, Brother Galloway was right that uh, th there's a double whammy there, uh, to use a modern lingo. Uh, I, that, oh, go ahead. I was going to say a triple whammy, I think. Okay. Because they also saw Jesus saying something to her, and she just got up and ran off. So you guys are uh, game show nuts, I take it. <laughs> That's from Press Your Luck, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> Uh-oh, I told on myself, didn't I? <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, but they didn't ask Jesus this question. John says they thought, you know, what do you seek? Or they, they didn't ask him these. They didn't question him about it. But she did leave the water pot and she left. And so let's talk about what she does next. What is the message that she takes back to the, the, the I guess, the city proper, where she goes back to in Samaria, there, where she's from? What does she take back to them? She says, here's a man that told me all things that I ever did. Now, he's already told her, I am the one that you're speaking about, talking about the Messiah coming. But she presents it like this. Could this be the Christ? Could this be the anointed one? Could this be the Messiah? Because he knew and told me all things that I had ever done. And so that information then caused them to go out with her to see him. Um you know, it, it, or go ahead, Bob. Uh, it strikes me that this would seem to imply that that John, the author, the gospel uh, writer, the apostle, has uh, simply summarized this conversation. True. That Jesus probably has said more to her than what John actually reveals, but that is a synopsis of what was actually said, and and. All John, everything, what John reveals is sufficient for us to know uh, that it made an impression upon her because he could not know that she had had five husbands and that she was now uh, shacking with a man to whom she had not married. Yeah. Okay. Um, real quick from the chat room, uh, David Clark talk, talks about a documentary on Roku TV called Ruby and the Well. Same thing we're talking about today. Interesting. I did not know of that. And then Caleb, he says that Jesus taught women before. So I think it's more that she was a Samaritan kind of coming at it from that, that, that information or that direction as well. And back in verse nine, when, when she calls attention, uh, is that the, you uh, are speaking to me as Samaritan, mm -hmm. it would be obvious that she was a woman. So she wouldn't have to say that. Yeah. 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 It was, that she's it's a Samaritan. Samaritan. Yeah. It's a good point. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mick has a thought here. Yeah, go ahead. Just, mm -hmm. oh, just one thought. Uh, <laughs> when this woman asked the question, could this be the Christ? Uh, sometimes, even in our studies, it takes a while to process information uh, for the evidence to be convincing or compelling to warrant a correct conclusion. And though this woman is expecting the coming of the Messiah and Jesus has told her all things that he ever did, it takes a while to process information based on evidence that seems irrefutable. Uh, even among the Jews, as you get over to the seventh chapter, uh, there is a great deal of discussion about can the rulers, this is verse 26, 
can it be that the rulers indeed know that this is the Christ? Uh, evidence uh, takes a while to finally sink in and be compelling. And I think this is the case perhaps in the minds of some of these who are questioning uh, the standpoint of the Jewish leaders. Uh, could it be they know that this is the Christ? Because when the Christ comes, is, is he going to do anything greater than this man has done? That's a good point. That's a good point. That's do you think there could be brought up too, not only in John 3, but in John 7? Yeah. Could there be a lesson here in about in personal evangelism that we could take away or kind of learn from? Uh, oh, yeah. With a Samaritan woman, ab absolutely. I mean, I, I use this as a as an example of that. I think we talked a little bit about this in our last lesson, of our last talk, you know, where you made the observation that she turned the physical to a spiritual you know, she turned the, the, the physical conversation of water into a spiritual. I, I definitely see this as uh, as an example of evangelism. You know, somebody that's got his ear to the ground looking for opportunities. And in a conversation, if he can turn it to spiritual matters to see where they are at. I think we definitely see that in this place here. So. I wasn't really thinking about that. I think that's a very good point, though. I really do. Um we could hope that the people that we're studying with are so easily, I was going to say convinced. She wasn't, e she wasn't quickly convinced, but there was enough there for her to say, could this be the Messiah? Let's go back, you know, and they went back. Uh, Mickey. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, uh, they are invited by this woman based on what evidence she has seen Let's, as you pointed out, let's go back. And so they did. Yeah. We can use that as a teaching tool. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, that also happened. Um, well, get my brain straight. Uh, Andrew and Peter and going to also Nathaniel as well. Let's grab them and, and go. Yeah. All, All right. right. Mm -hmm. Another lesson is that we need to show the kind of patience that Jesus did and not expecting people to learn it too quickly or learn it more quickly than we think they ought to. Yeah. Uh, we've all taught people who, you know, surely I've said enough to convince her that baptism is essential to salvation or, or him. Uh, but it may be that they just need time to reflect to do what the Tesla uh, Jews of, of Berea did, search the scriptures in our, even in our absence, is what Bob said, really what the Bible teaches, uh, or as John, mm -hmm. uh, what, what John Duvall says, is that really what the Bible teaches? And so sometimes I think we need to, to give people a little benefit of the doubt that once pressure is of the, of the situation that we are a part of is, uh, is changed so that they've got time to reflect that maybe they will eventually come to the truth, even though we may think at the time that we failed. Yeah. How many farmers do you see going out and yelling at the seed that hasn't come up through the ground yet causes the seed to come up from the ground? Yeah. That happened. You got to be patient. Yeah. Although God oh. could have raised up children of Israel from the stones. That's right. Good point. But the farmer, um, can't, do the farmer can't do that. That's right. Well, speaking of stones, the devil tempted Jesus, turn them to bread. Since we're talking about bread, let's talk about the food. So let's continue here and looking at what we're talking about there in verse number 31. So the disciples come to Jesus and they, they say to him, Rabbi, eat. And he says to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Now, most everything with Jesus, if not every conversation, but I'll say most conversations with Jesus, you can see that he intentionally goes in a direction that's going to end up teaching them or making some point that they need to learn from. Um, he very well could have said, oh, thank you. I'm hungry. Or 
lost my appetite, whatever, I, you know, whatever the situation really was physically. But he saw this as an opportunity because they came up, saw him teaching a woman. He knew they had questions about him talking to the woman. And so then he uses this opportunity, I believe, to really address the very thing that he was doing and to show the very thing that they would need to do as well. Um, so they come up to him, they say, and he says to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And then the question, has anyone brought him anything to eat? So Paul, if you will, let's start there in verse number 34, and let's go ahead and look at his discussion with them down through verse number 38. All right. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and read from the New King James since that's where we were before. Okay. Uh, John 4, 34 through 38. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right, so backing up there to verse number 34, his answer to them, Paul, is quite enigmatic, maybe, if I'm using the word properly. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What are your thoughts on that phrase and that statement in of itself? Well, they're they're concerned. Like uh, you've probably heard people with their family. Uh, I've seen people at funerals before, and they're so uh, focused on the one who's lost, and and all the relatives and friends who are gathered, and and maybe they have forgotten to eat. And uh, th there's the concern there that they could be weak, or they could pass out, uh, or just not be well. And the disciples there are, are encouraging Jesus. Uh, to eat, would somebody bring him some food? Uh, it seems, and so, uh, and he says, "Well, uh, food does sustain, but what sustains me is to do what my Father sent me to do, to complete the work that I have to do, and that's what uh, is sustaining." And he talks to them not only about the finishing his work, but he talks to them about work they are doing. And how valuable that is. I think this is a, a really great point. Um, if I'm, you know, if I have a good understanding here, that he's talking about um, the field. Uh, they are white for harvest. There's a, an opportunity here, and uh, certainly Jesus's work was the most important. It's the the most important work that has ever been done. But in doing that work, he also emphasizes that there is work for them to do that is very important. I think we can take a lesson from that, that there, uh, for every Christian, uh, for preachers and elders and, and members and deacons and all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, works that are given to do, uh, that there is an importance to that, and it needs to be taken on, uh, it needs to be addressed seriously. Um, one sows and other reaps and, and sometimes you cross over and sometimes someone else starts something and you finish it um, sometimes there's some teaching that's done and in doing that teaching uh, you see that someone else ends up maybe baptizing that person or sees the gospel obedience take place uh, where you don't and so and, and you see, maybe you plant the seed and even they become a Christian, but you don't see them grow to maturity. He's saying every one who has work to do has important work to do. But Jesus certainly, uh, he says, what I have to do is more important than if I have lunch today, uh, I guess. It's a good explanation. Good explanation. Bob, you got a thought? Yes. I want us to go back to, uh, to verse verses seven and eight, okay. Uh, because I think this is something that stresses 
uh, providence. And I think far too many preachers have too narrow a view of uh, of providence. But in, in verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Then John explains why he asked her. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. They're not there. He can't ask his disciples for drink. And, and so he asked her, but there's a reason for which he's asking her. Uh, they're out of the picture. He doesn't want to, he's, they're not ready for it apparently, or uh, they got plenty of time to learn it. They're going to be with him, spending a lot of time with it. So he allows them to go into the city. But my point to bring that up here is that they have made this trip into the city to buy food and they come back and they think Jesus is, must be hungry. And so, uh, rise, rise, eat. We, we, we've done been to town. We bought food and, uh, you obviously been out here all day. You haven't had anything to eat. You need, you need physical nourishment. And as Paul pointed out, even Jesus needed spiritual nourishment. And I think that's something that has not always, that I've not always appreciated. Uh, I mean, he said as much in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 in the temptation. Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so here he's, here's also a source of sustenance for us is to do the Lord's work. And that's what he's doing. He's doing his work, which of course is, of course is God's work. And, and we are to go and do likewise. And uh, so he needed spiritual nourishment and he got his from teaching others. And in, in getting his spiritual nourishment by teaching the woman, she gains spiritual nourishment by his teaching her and his disciples now have their opportunity to receive spiritual nourishment as he explains to them that he doesn't really need the food they've been to the, been to the city to buy as much as they think he does. And, and so, uh, but again, they, I think they, they needed to be out of the picture for the time being so he could deal with her one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And and now they've come back. They don't understand what's going on. You need to you need to get something to eat, Lord. You're gonna you're gonna pass out here. And, okay. But he had the sustenance he needed. All right. Uh good point. Tom, let's talk to you. Go ahead, Mick. I, I was just gonna add that you. sustenance is one thing. Sustenance we have to have. It's a necessity or we'll die. But I think also involved in a good meal is satisfaction. When Jesus has taught this woman, it's satisfying. And we need to see that element of teaching someone as well. That's a good point. Our satisfaction, our satisfaction comes with the dessert, right? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah, you, you, you know, uh, uh, you, you can build on that. I know Bob was also making the point about you know, you've got the idea of Jesus needing the spiritual sustenance. I I, I just recently preached a sermon on uh, the prayers of Jesus. And, and, and I've always emphasized, and I, I think one of the most powerful points to emphasize the importance of prayer is here you have Jesus, the very Son of God, you know, knows who he is, able to do all these miracles, direct line of communication with God. Yet look at how much time he spends in prayer. And, and, and I'm convinced, I'm convinced that's a part of how he was able to live without sin. You know, because he understood the significance of spiritual sustenance. And of course, if he had to pray, what's that say about you and me? You know, so. Yeah, good point. We have a couple of comments uh, we'll bring in from the uh, chat room here in just a moment. But Brian, did you have a thought you wanted to share? 
Well, I wanted to say something, and I, and I, I hope it's not too controversial, but I wanted to say that all my life, I've always heard people take these statements of the fields being white to harvest and saying, hey, everybody look around, the fields are white to harvest. Um, and there's a specific context to the conversation when Jesus says these things, whether it's uh, Mark 9 or Luke 10, I think. Uh, in both instances, it's when he's sending out the apostles to the Israelites. And there's something kind of particular about that moment that it was the fullness of time that there was a you know, that that uh, everything in Israel had been brought about, that the uh, John the Baptist had been doing his work and getting everybody ready. And I, I kind of have always wondered if we are meant to use those terms to apply to our times as well, particularly since it seems like there's ebbs and flows of society's willingness to hear the messages of the gospel sometimes. And, and you know, you know, those of us, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of you guys are like me, grew up on a farm, you know that on a farm, it's not always time to harvest. Sometimes it's time to plant, sometimes it's time to water, sometimes it's time to plow. And it and it kind of is important to understand that it's not you're not always seeing the result of the work you're doing. Sometimes you're doing work that you're looking ahead with an expectation or a hope that that work comes to a result later. So I always kind of think of this passage and you know somebody it seems like every bible class somebody will say um you know we're we're concluding, you know, we're we're bringing, you know, this time now. I'm not sure that's always meant to be taken that way. Hey, hey, you know, John, before you get to the comments, just building on what Brian just said, mm -hmm. I want to let Mickey say something that he said in a sermon last night, mm -hmm. dealing with that very idea of what Brian was saying. Well, I was talking about preaching the word in season and out of season a long time ago. A fellow told me, an older preacher, that that means to preach it when they like it and when they don't like it. Though that be true, I think there's an additional layer to that. Sometimes, as we were commenting about the, the church building here, which will hold about 300 people, and it's been full in times gone by during meetings that have put out chairs. And to what do we attribute that? It's not that way now. Uh, I would dare say in most of the congregations where we labor and work, uh, sometimes the gospel is just appealing and then sometimes societal and cultural changes take place when the gospel is just not as appealing to the public as it once was. Now, what do we do? You keep on preaching it. There's never a time to slack up because it's out of season or not popular to preach the gospel. You keep preaching it. That's a good point. That's a good way of looking at that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Before ahead, we preach, mm -hmm. I want to make... And I know I'm monopolizing the time here, and I, it's just that I don't get this kind of opportunity often. And sure. it, and I really appreciate this show and ARE and and the study with Joe Price and others. Uh, but uh, so I'd like to take these opportunities as often as I can. I'm not too awful long ago. I saw a, a YouTube video. I don't reckon the guy was a Christian. But he was a preacher, and I, I thought he made a, a good point. He says, sometimes the uh, the ground needs, the, to the soil needs to be tilled before we can plant the seed. And, and he explained it, and I think he's probably right, that as we live our daily lives in the presence of others, we have a positive influence on them. And this positive influence is preparing them, their hearts, uh, to be receptive when we do finally get around to saying, would you like to have a Bible study with me? And if we haven't been tilling the soil, you know, we're not ready to plant the seed. Uh, but there comes a time when we need to quit tilling and start planting, I understand. Uh, and that's, you know, timing is, is uh, everything in a lot of ways. But I, I just wanted to say that we need to be conscious of the fact that, yeah, they might not be uh, receiving the seed right now. But maybe we need to toy uh, to till just a little longer. It's an excellent point. Um, and that that starts a whole new thread of conversation about evangelism, even on the local part of local evangelists, there's got to be some level of involvement with people that you are around to do what you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. a good point. 
So let me bring in a couple comments real quick and then we will will wrap up. This one goes back a few minutes, technically 15 minutes according to the to the um, app I'm on. David Clark said it's interesting that he spoke to a woman, not a man. Just like resurrection, he went to he went to women um, to verify the, the this important event. That's a good point. You know, many times he did do that. He did talk to women. Uh, Jimmy throws in there the good thought. I'm more of a question. Could the idea of the harvest refer to our Christianity and our growth as Christians, similar to the milk reference being referred to for a new Christian? That's and that again, that kind of launches us into another discussion over when he talks about the field being white to harvest. Is it this they are ready to be taught or ready to be convicted, or even like you're talking about in our own lives, the maturity of our faith as we grow? Um, and then I'm not going to say his name right, I'm sure, but Vidar, uh, it's Vida VJ. Cigar. It's VJ. VJ. <laughs> I'm not going to remember that one. <laughs> I have enough names to remember. I'm not going to remember that. VJ. He quotes from Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then, um, Brian, you had a good comment there in referencing what Jimmy said. I like your idea of seeing this as a personal growth idea too. We have times to grow and times to reap what we grow personally. And then Aileen, she says, someone had taught the woman about Messiah, that Messiah was coming. The Jews didn't give the Samaritans credit for seeking the Messiah, which was an interesting point. And uh, Brian adds to that. He said, Mrs. Haynes, being respectful that she is his mom. It is interesting that somehow even Gentiles had sense of a Messiah coming, like the wise men in Matthew 2. The Roman Tychicus are tacked Tychicus, no, Tacitus. Anyway, Tacitus. Tacitus. Tacitus says that uh, Romans had a prophecy of a savior. And then VJ then says, quoting from uh, Hosea 4, 8, they eat up the sins of my people. Okay. Any thoughts or comments about those thoughts and comments that we quickly reviewed? Okay. I guess not. But we are at the end of our study, so we want to take a moment to thank you for joining us today. If this is the first time that you've joined us for a study, we want you to know that you are welcomed to be here anytime. you will be our welcome guest if you'd like to join into our study. And if you have any thoughts or comments, you can send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Be sure to send it there. Um, or you can write to us individually, as you see on the screen beside you there. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is uh, Truth Factor Live, and follow us on Facebook, which is also Truth Factor Live. That way you'll receive notifications of our future live studies. All righty. Anything else, gentlemen? Mickey, it's good to have you with us today. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. and, and just, to, just to let you know about the meeting, uh, uh, goes through Friday night. So if you are in the Los Angeles area, we'd love to have you. Also, the lessons are being recorded and posted on our website, which is roseavenue.org. So you can go there and you can get the links to all of his material. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, we, great to know. We also have a gospel meeting starting Friday night uh, through Sunday. And the lessons will be on ellisvillechurchofchrist.com. Or if you're in South Central Indiana, we'd love to see you. Uh, J.R. Bronger is going to be here. Oh, good. Okay. You do a good job. All right. He does, he does a very good job. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. We will see you then, Lord willing, next Thursday back here at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time as we continue through our study. And let me go ahead and state real quick, let's pick up right around verse 39. Unless there's anything we want to back up and look at, we'll officially start John 4, verse 39. All right. Everyone have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time.